So welcome back, everybody. I hope you're suitably refreshed for the second part uh, of the day's proceedings. Now, the next part of the dialogues will focus on inspiration and empowerment through a series of one-on-one -on -one discussions between Aurora humanitarians and the selection committee members. And we'll discover what drives and inspires them to do their work. But first, we're going to hear from Alice Greenwald, President and CEO of the National September the 11th Memorial and Museum. She's here to do an introductory talk on the importance of inspiration in creating a new generation of change makers. Welcome, Alice. Thank you so much, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, we are about to be introduced to the three individuals who are being honored this year as humanitarians, each of them worthy of recognition as potential recipients of this year's Aurora Prize. They are being recognized for their selfless courage, their extraordinary impact, and their fearless commitment to the fundamental value of human life. In a moment, we will be privileged to hear their stories and we will know that we are in the presence of heroes. But what do we mean by that word, heroes? Too often, when we hear that word, we immediately conjure up images of individuals with superhuman powers doing superhuman things. But this is not the true nature of heroism. True heroism is exemplified by a story I heard many years ago about a Polish housewife who, when asked why she had taken in and hidden, fed, and protected a Jewish child during the Holocaust at the risk of her own life and the safety of her own family, was baffled by the question. She looked quizzically at the interviewer, and she answered, because that's what people do. That's what people do. Yet we know that not all people respond selflessly when witnessing injustice in the face of unimaginable danger or violence, that they, don't, they come to the aid of others without regard for their own well-being. Still, we know stories of men and women who do choose to respond, individuals like our three Aurora humanitarians, who choose in times of grave danger to step up in selfless, compassionate, and essentially humane ways. It's as if human beings fall on a spectrum, high or low, as we do with our IQ or our EQ, emotional intelligence. Perhaps there is another quotient to be measured, another EQ, or perhaps we should call it an MQ, empathic intelligence. Heroes are people with high empathic intelligence. We live, however, in a world where there is a shocking degree of what psychologists now call empathy deficit. And so we are all the more amazed when we encounter people who act out of a surplus of empathy for their fellow human beings. Now, at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum, where I am privileged to lead, the stories we tell are filled with tragedy and heartbreak. Against this backdrop of grief, we also tell stories of courage and resilience, of coworkers helping coworkers, of strangers coming to the aid of strangers, first responders running into danger to rescue and assist, stories that testify to the triumph of human decency over human depravity, stories that offer a powerful reminder that it is really in times of greatest darkness that we do shine the brightest. Our visitors cannot escape the reality at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum that human beings are capable of doing terrible things to one another, and that we may not always have complete control over preventing or avoiding such horrific situations. But our visitors also gain a deeper understanding that the one thing we do have control over is how we respond. They learn that the story of 9-11 is also the story of 9-12, epitomized by acts of public service and volunteerism. That spirit of generosity, born of shared grief and a fundamental recognition of shared humanity, becomes a model for how to live in an interconnected world, 
How we respond defines who we are and what kind of society we want to bequeath to our children and our grandchildren. At a time when lack of empathy for the misfortunes of others is routinely demonstrated, promoted, and even at times legislated, there is no more effective way to champion the value and urgency of action in support of others than to celebrate the stories of those who step up. These stories must be told, they need to be remembered, but most importantly, we need to learn from them. In that spirit, last March, the 9-11 Memorial and Museum co-hosted a notable event with the Aurora Humanitarian Initiative, a New York City-based Aurora Dialogues that was focused on the theme of solidarity beyond borders, stepping up when others step back. The program explored the question of why some people are motivated to take heroic action to help others during times of extreme adversity, despite great personal risk. Some of the speakers from that event are actually here with us uh, for this Aurora Dialogues. Um, and I will just mention, we have with us Bill Keegan, who is a retired Port Authority police lieutenant who also served as the night operations commander at Ground Zero. He is the founder of an emergency aid organization called Heart 9-11. We have John Prendergast, who also participated and spoke yesterday, human rights activist and founding director of the Genocide Prevention Initiative, the Enough Project, and of course, Marguerite Barankitsi, the 2016 Aurora Laureate, um, who I think all of you already know uh, is credited with saving 20,000 children during, in Burundi during the ethnic cleansing massacres of the 1990s, and in the years since has provided shelter and education uh, to tens of thousands through Maison Shalom, the complex of schools and hospitals that she founded. These three are role models for compassion and for hope. They are, in fact, heroes in our own time. But they are not alone. People who step up can be found all over the world. They are our neighbors and friends, our colleagues, our family members. In fact, they are us. They are just like us, except that they have chosen to respond to the needs of others in seemingly exceptional ways. The point of sharing their stories is that in hearing them, we might recognize something familiar. We might imagine ourselves in their circumstances. We might ourselves become emboldened because if they are able to do these things, perhaps we are too. Today, we are incredibly fortunate to hear from another three role models and this evening, when Aurora recognizes these humanitarians, we will be given a great gift, the gift of insight into what has empowered each of them. That gift, though, comes with an obligation. Having heard their stories, we in turn must tell them to others. And in doing that, we will ourselves be empowered, not to act exactly as they have, but as ambassadors of the possible, when faced with the unthinkable, to conscientiously advance our shared aspiration for a new generation of heroes. Thank you. Thank you, thanks Alice. Thank you very much, very inspiring words. Now, since its inception three years ago, Aurora has truly been able to reach the world, not only through the laureates' work, but through the work of their designated organizations, and you'll be seeing them on the map here. Now, these people working on the ground to make a difference are all true modern-day heroes. But no heroic act is possible without inspiration, as Alice said, and inspiration lies at the heart of empowerment. This year's Aurora Humanitarians are going to share their stories with you today. They're going to have a series of one-on-one -on -one discussions with an Aurora Selection Committee member. So first, I'd like to welcome to the stage Sunita Krishnan. Sunita. Sunita is co-founder of Prajwala. And 
Talking to her today will be Gareth Evans. Gareth, of course, President Emeritus of the International Crisis Group, Chancellor of the Australian National University, former Australian Foreign Minister, and Aurora Prize Selection Committee member. Thank you. Well, thanks, Jane. And Sunita, first of all, warmest congratulations on being an Aurora Thank finalist. You. you have been described as a pocket dynamo, the tiny powerhouse from Hyderabad who, since the establishment of Prajwala in the 1990s, mid-1990s, has achieved some really fantastic things in the protection of trafficked women and their children, sex workers, to the extent that you have now established what is acknowledged to be the biggest sex trafficking shelter of its kind in the world. I know in all of this you don't want to focus so much on the past, as the future, but perhaps you could begin by just sharing with us a little bit more about that incredibly harrowing experience that you had, which initiated all those years ago, which really initiated and inspired your activism. Um, thank you, Gareth. Um, at four feet, six inches, I think it's a good inspiration for everybody. If I can do this, all of you also can do it. It's very easy to do it. It's not so great and so heroic. Um, I don't want to dwell so much about the rape per se. I was gang raped by eight men. But I think what changed me and what transformed me is what came after. The, the exclusion, the ostracization. There was a period in my life from my, my birth to 15 years where I was the best ch child of my family and my community. I was a role model. And suddenly I was the worst human being. I was characterless, I was moralless, and I was accused of a crime that I did not commit. The sheer, sheer injustice of that and then I took a decision during can, can, that time. Can you explain what, what happened that you were accused of? Because a lot of people won't know. You know, the rape per se was definitely something which was extremely um, unpleasant, if I may say so. Uh, but, you know, when your whole family is accused of giving you too much of freedom, and that's why it happened. Everywhere you go, I remember there were parents who told their children not to sit with me because I would corrupt their minds. Meaning I would sit in, this, in a bench and people would actually move out of me. I was treated to Cold War for many, many, many months. For two years, I was subjected to extreme exclusion. I think compounded with the fact was a fa thing that, you know, you know, life is about the choices you make. So I made a choice not to be a victim. I made a choice to be a survivor. And when you make a choice to be a survivor, you behave in a certain way. And you start saying, when I'm not responsible for this, if anybody should be ashamed, it's the, it's the eight men who raped me who should be ashamed of themselves. So why are you looking at me like this? People didn't like that. Meaning all of us, and it's not just Indian community, but everywhere in the world, we like to see people, any victim crying and hiding the face and you know, going in depression, that really titillates us. We are very very happy to listen to those kind of stories, and our heart bleeds. We don't like a survivor standing up boldly and saying things. And so when I said that at the age of 15, people didn't like it, so it became uh, a double stigma. Look at her, she's so arrogant, she's so moralist, she doesn't learn from her experience. And in many ways, that kind of thing, I've been hearing it for the last 27 years. Even today, there are there are even my colleagues in my sector who would say that I'm talking about my rape experience maybe to get better funding or to get more name and fame. Meaning that is the kind of mindsets we are talking about where you're mentally excluding people. I went through that for two years and that the sheer injustice of being unfairly accused of a crime that I did not commit, I think that anger is my triggering point. And very, um, very honestly, that anger is what has driven me for the last 26 years. 
the anger sustains me and that anger has only grown in the last 26 years because today I see thousands of such cases. I, I deal with eight months baby being raped. I deal with 10 year old child who has been raped thousands times in a brothel and I see the attitude of the community still the same. My children, my girls are rejected. Nobody likes them. You, you like to listen to a story like this, it's fine. You like to see a movie like this, it's fine. But it is not fine to give them a job. It is not fine to accept them back in your families. It is not fine to provide them with empathetic support, which will, so today, my name itself is a bad name for my children. You know, that's the stigma I face. If you say you're from Prajwala, it means, oh, you are sex trafficked, or you're raped. So, you, you know, I personally carry a baggage of bad name for my children and my girls. Your organization has five main objectives, prevention, rescue, rehabilitation, reintegration, and advocacy. We haven't got time to discuss in detail all of those things, but could you just pick out a few highlights of where you think in those last 20 plus years you've been most successful against those objectives? I think uh, there would be three major achievements that I can talk about. In prevention, we have prevented a few thousand children from being inducted into, into prostitution and sex trafficking by intervening at the second generation level, at the intergenerational level, because a child of a prostitute would be the first target for a potential, to be a potential victim. So we've been able to start learning centers for these children, over 9,600 children. So we've been able to show that there is a way that it can be prevented. In prevention also, we have engaged with men and boys. And I think that has been something which has become very successful over the years because today I have huge number of informers from across the globe who keep in giving us information. There's a 10-year-old child here. There's, and these are men who either are buyers or are w walking around buyers. And I think there's a huge uh, uh, impact. The second achievement I would say is we've been, you know, for centuries people have believed that this is kind of a necessary evil. You want to live with sex slavery. Sex slavery is not a story of India, it's a story of every country which is sitting here. And somewhere we have kind of given up in our minds and we think, oh, this cannot change, you cannot really, you know, um, uh, rehabilitate or restore dignity in the lives of such victims. And there are even a, 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 a section of the society would say, let us legitimize it, let us legalize you know, brothels and prostitution so that everything becomes, you know, okay to do it and there's less, less exploitation. What we have been able to show is that it is possible to remove people from exploitation. It is possible to empower them. It is possible to restore dignity in their lives. And more than anything else, it is possible to empower them as leaders who can lead a movement. Today, the organization that I run is led by survivors. 50% of my staff are survivor leaders who are leading the movement. They are doing the rescues. They are doing the community awakening. They are doing the entire churning of the community to, to show us you know, a way out. The third thing that I think we have achieved is being able to break the silence within our governments on this issue. So much of denial on this problem, through our advocacy work, we've been able to push the government to, to look at this problem. And today, at this point of time in 2018, we're looking at a comprehensive legislation to combat trafficking in India, thanks to not only my efforts, but many, many other people like me who are working in India. But also, we have been able to push tech firms like Google, Facebook, YouTube, and many other companies to look at you know, taking accountability for, for the content on their space. All the social media sites are becoming the biggest platform today for the circulation of rape videos. And we have, been, we have forced the tech firms to, you know, to look at whether they can play a role in blocking this content. One of your most adventurous bits of advocacy was publishing on the web 
very graphic, harrowing videos of women being raped, their anonymity secured by fuzzing out their faces, but keeping the men's faces very clear indeed. You've got a lot of backlash over that, but has the overall impact of that been to make a difference in the way <coughs> policymakers have responded to these issues? Are you making progress? I think um, if you see India before 2015 and India after 2015, and when I say 2015, it, it is in February 2015 that I started the Shame the Rapist campaign. And, uh, and that started with two videos that uh, I got from uh, to concerned citizens, and one was this uh, rape of a 12-year-old girl by eight men, and another was this uh, uh, rape of this woman and a third person doing. What outraged me was, here were these eight men who were raping this girl, actually flaunting their rape. So they were telling the camera guy, come this side, come this side, I, you know, and he's masturbating and he's saying, take my portion of it. That smiles on their face, and that is, that's the reason that I put those videos up, because I wanted to see, show the world what we are coming to. All of us today here are responsible for contributing to an enabling environment of impunity. That is what they were flaunting. I can do this, I can record it, I can disseminate it, and nothing will happen to me. We went to the Supreme Court. The case has been now given to the Central Bureau of Investigation. For the first time, the country accepts there's impunity of this kind and something more needs to be done. But also for the first time, the tech firms who have been the basic platform, and I think tech firms have played a very, very big, important role, not only in the good things of the world, but also in the bad things of the world. And one of them is to give all the rapists and perpetrators of sex offenses across the world the, the confidence to do it with a with lot of courage. And that has been confronted for the first time now. Sunita, tell us a little bit more about the rehabilitation and reintegration component of your work. When you get these terribly distressed and people coming to you with incredible life stories, is there any, how long does it take to get people back on their feet with sufficient confidence to go back into the wider community? Is there any general rule about this? Or just, just tell us what your experience has been. What do they leave Prabhala with? Um, just for the context, you need to understand what is the profile of the person that I'm dealing with. A 12-year-old child in a brothel means, you know, I'm giving you a very modest number, say 10 customers a day. In most red light areas in India, it will be 40 to 50 customers a day. But let's take the most least number, 10. That means 3,650 men a year. And if she has been in a brothel for five years, it means close to 18,000 men in five years who have raped her every day. None of us reach rescue a girl as soon as she comes in. We rescue her four or five years later. So the person who comes in our hand is a person, A, who has no trust in humanity, has no trust in herself, has actually started normalizing the experience of being exploited every day. Here's a person who now feels nobody's going to accept me back to the world, so I'm like, okay, it's okay to get raped every day, it's okay to be you know, in this world of exploitation, then come out of this. So that is the person. This person is also having a huge huge, you know, uh, plethora of infections. She's, she's sick, she's got sexually transmitted infections, she's got uh, traumatic brain injuries, she might be, you know, HIV positive, and she might be having all kinds of other ailments. Plus, she's a substance abuser, she's an alcoholic. Meaning you can't be having sex with 10 men a day if you, are, if you are sane. You'll have to be intoxicated to be doing that. So she's a substance abuser, she's drug addict. It is this person who's coming in my hand uh, post-rescue. And therefore, f my f first challenge is to ensure and create an enabling environment for her to, first of all, accept that she's a victim. Because she's kind of repeatedly telling, I am doing this because I like it. Why are you removing me from that place? That's the primary dialogue that she would tell me. So it takes a lot of time to first 
provide her that initial support, apart from giving her all the health and other benefits. But then, you know, rehabilitation is about a combination of processes. It's a combination of psychosocial interventions, trauma care, counseling, psychiatric intervention. It's also about life skills, because so much of your body gets damaged in a brothel. Um, I sit like this and you sit like this because this is what we have been told in our, in our, from our childhood, this is the right way to sit. But in a brothel, you're told to sit with your legs wide apart. You know, you're supposed to be looking at men and people around you with, when you have to seduce them, you have to bring them to you. That is the competition, that is the target. So your entire body has changed. So you require a lot of life skills to unlearn all the damages of that. And then, on a, based on an age-appropriate method, we work like with children, we take education as our method. With adults, we use um, uh, vocational training. Uh, so today, many of my children are doing medicine, they're doing law, they're doing pharmacy. Um, they are you know, professionals in multinational companies. My women are working as welders, as carpenters, as masons, as television camera assistants, as gym trainers. So. Uh, a whole lot of things goes into rehabilitation uh, and this combined with restoration of their civic identity to get a name in the society. A small thing is like a bank account gives you a name, um, uh, uh, you know, a, a passport is a name, so she, getting that becomes the last part of rehabilitation process which leads to reintegration. Just to give people a sense of the scale of your achievement, about how many women and their kids have you assisted in these various ways over the 20 plus years that Prajwala has been operating? Gareth, I actually don't like your question because I don't see anything that I have done as an achievement. I more than anybody else and I don't think any of you all sitting here know what I have not done. When I go to a red light area in, in Delhi, in GB Road or in Kamatipura in Mumbai or in Pune, in Budwar Pet in Pune, I may pick out 100 girls and come out. But if I have to look back, there will be a 6,000 that I have not done. There are 3 million official number of women and children in sex slavery in India. I have done just a, just a dot. I have just removed 20,000 of them. It's not even a speck of the problem. So I don't consider that as a big achievement. But what I consider as a big achievement, maybe I have not changed the world, maybe I have not changed the whole, whole situation of sex slap, slavery, but I have definitely changed the world of each one of that human beings whom I have pulled out of sex slavery. Not, may not be each one of them, but out of the 20,000, around 18,500 of them, I know I have changed their world. What? Given the, given the magnitude of that task that still lies ahead, what are your greatest challenges and obstacles in continuing the work that you're doing? Um, I fight against an organized crime, so obviously uh, my, my occupational hazard is to get beaten up by the criminal syndicate. So it's a very normal thing for us to get beaten up and physically assaulted. I have been personally assaulted around 17 times in my life. My, my offices have been evicted, I have been moved out, I've been thrown out, but that is an occupational hazard. But I think the bigger challenge that I face is the attitude of, of the world and the society, um, the amount of work that we do to rescue a person, and when the world rejects that person, I think that is a bigger challenge. My bigger challenge is the apathy and inaction of the so-called good in the world, the governments, the civil society, who know it and choose not to do anything about it. To me, that's a bigger challenge. One Sunita is not going to change the world. I am aware of it. That's my bigger challenge. How do we multiply the number of people who can come into this mission and do what we are doing? Just a final question. You did say once that your ultimate goal was to end sex trafficking globally. How do you feel in terms of the progress that's being made in that direction. Are you a Bernard Kushner pessimist full of gloom and anxiety about the state of the world or are you a Gareth Evans kind of incorrigible optimist that uh, with the right kind of mindset and the right kind of energy and commitment and inspiration that you've shown you can in fact 
get there eventually. How do you feel about this? Are you optimistic? Absolutely. I think if all of us sitting here in this hall, in this room, each one of us take a decision today that we will engage with two men and boys in our lifetime and tell them the story and make them real men of the world who don't abuse children. I think it's possible if each one of us take a decision to change the way uh, men and boys are brought up in the world across the globe. You know, every family takes that responsibility. I think it will end, you know, like this, if, if we want to. It's just that whether we want to do it or not. And I believe, yes, we want to do it and we will do it. Please join me. Please join me in thanking Sunita Krishnan. I'm wishing her every success for tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sunita and Gareth. And actually, we're now going to show you a video which will let you see exactly some of the extraordinary work that Sunita and her co-workers uh, do in India. The most transformative part of my journey was being gang raped at the age of 15. Um, I think that changed my life in many ways. What bothers me is the fact that I was treated as a criminal by the society. There was so much exclusion that I was subjected to for a crime that I had not committed at all. That anger drove me into believing that I want to commit my life. I want to commit every breath in my being for somebody who's going through a situation like mine. In India, hundreds of sex crimes are committed every day. The government estimates that there are around two to three million children and women in sex slavery, which actually means that the numbers could be anything between 15 to 18 million. Dumgi dene gan me ban holo ko baat sun ke aayi. Aayi to tin din ka rasta hai. Holo ka acha se kha le re, pi le re. Mere ko kuch bhi nahi de re. To main ro re to main majboor ho ke haan bole, haan bole to. Jab main kya karu? Aisa aisa kar ke holo ke mere ko sida nahi nahi karega to bale se kaat deti, gadan kaati. Prashant has an anti-trafficking organization working uh, on the issue of sex trafficking and sex crimes from rescue. Uh, to rehabilitation and reintegration. We are involved in all aspects of anti-trafficking. We also do a lot of work in prevention. The most important thing is to prevent second generation prostitution by providing educational opportunities to children of women in prostitution. We enter brothels and rescue our children and women out of uh, sex slavery. Today, even seeing a three, three and a half year old child being sold into a brothel is not very surprising. That to me is very, very scary. So rescue per se is very, very dramatic act. What is more challenging is the rehabilitation. How much time does it take? I don't know because every victim is unique. Somebody takes a day's time, somebody takes a week's time, somebody might take a couple of years' time to come to this recognition. Today, my girls have come a long way. Thousands of them have gone back to the society. They are living a very, very dignified life. Thousands of them have gotten married. Young women are trained here as builders, welders, carpenters, all of them in viable economic option. In 2015, I received two rape videos on WhatsApp. It was shocking, to say the least. I exposed the faces of the rapists, requesting the public to support me to find the sex offenders. There were thousands of rape videos in circulation. Is there a day when all this will end? I do believe, yes, this will end. That is my mission. My mission in life is to end sex slavery from this world. Now, our second Aurora humanitarian, Father Tomas Gonzalez Castillo, 
Uh, we're going to show you now a video of his work before I welcome him to the stage with Mary Robinson. So here is the work of Father Thomas. <laughs> Y ese proyecto de la Casa del Migrante es recibir a la gente más vulnerable de la región, a los pobres. Que el denominador común es que son pobres que han tenido que salir de sus países por razones económicas o por la violencia criminal que hay ahora en Centroamérica. Recuerdo una tarde de que salí, venía llegando del trabajo. Mi esposa estaba llorando y lo único que me repetía una y otra vez era vámonos, vámonos, tenemos que irnos, vámonos. Realmente había llegado un hombre extraño, bueno, llegaron varios hombres. Realmente le dijeron de que si yo no me unía a ellos, que o a ella le iban a matar y también iban a matar al niño. La gente está atrapada en el sur de México, no pueden salir. Si salen a las carreteras, está migración con la Policía Federal fuertemente armada, esperándolos. Si se van en el tren, se van a enfrentar con el crimen organizado. Me trepé en la noche al tren y seguí hasta Chontalpa. Allá saltaron el tren ese día. Pararon de 8 a 10 hombres, se treparon. ¿eh? ¡Viva la América! ¡La América! Y en algunas partes del país, los cárteles de la droga nos secuestran o no pueden pagar el rescate de sus familias, los matan. En agosto de 2010 aparecieron 72 cuerpos de personas migrantes masacradas en San Fernando, Tamaulipas. Cuando viene la masacre de los 72, se descubre lo que está pasando en México. Entonces, nosotros acá en el sur tomamos como, como nombre número, el número de los 72. ¿no? Nuestra primera de trabajo es la asistencia humanitaria. Damos, ofrecemos comida, ofrecemos hospedaje, ofrecemos servicios de salud. Muchos de ellos vienen con las plantas de los pies deshechas por las grandes caminatas o con dolores musculares, dolores de cabeza por el sol, la caminata, en fin. Y sin exagerar, yo creo que esta gente sufre el Via Crucis como lo sufrió Jesús. Y cada golpe que les da migración, cada humillación que les da a la sociedad mexicana xenófoba, cada extorsión de parte de las autoridades migratorias es un clavo, es un golpe que le dan a esta gente. Y son la imagen de Jesús crucificado. Están malditos, lo dice Dios. Quien agarra un arma, quien diseña una estrategia, una política migratoria para hacer morir a un inocente que lo único que quiere es caminar, atravesar un país para llegar a trabajar y tener una vida digna, eso es una maldición. Eso no puede ser una bendición. Well, Father Tomás González Castillo is, as you know, the founder of La 72. Please welcome him to the stage, Father Tomás. And to talk to him, we have Mary Robinson, president of the Mary Robinson Foundation, chancellor of the Trinity College, Dublin, honorary president of Oxfam, former UN High Commissioner for Human Rights and former president of Ireland. She is on the Aurora Prize Selection Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Father Castillo, first of all, warm congratulations. Felicidades for your being a finalist um, for the Aurora Prize. As you can see, I came on stage already primed with translation. So those of you who don't understand Spanish, please uh, equip yourselves uh, with the simultaneous uh, translation. It is a great pleasure to have this opportunity to ask you to tell us a little more about your own story, 
Uh, we know that you called your organization after the 72 migrants who were found, their bodies mutilated, killed. But what inspired you to get involved with this huge issue of migrants, immigrants? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the invitation. And this committee and this initiative, our, our initiative, and I am uh, considering that uh, real heroes and my uh, inspiration are the migrant people that were ex uh, that had to leave their countries and they have to uh, cross the whole uh, South America. And uh, I have the uh, I have the obligation to serve them. It's not possible to see uh, a person that is bleeding, bleeding, and uh, per persecuted by the migration officers, uh, women. Uh, that suffer violence uh, because of uh, um, criminals and we cannot uh, remain without uh, um, without making any actions and undertaking and, and whatever they are looking for is to find a dignified uh, way of living. Um, I know that you feel very much for the pain and suffering and what the migrants endure on the journey. Tell us a little bit about uh, what you have seen and witnessed, um, both when they come to La 72, your organization, and when they leave. Sí. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, make understand the whole context of the region from there they are coming. It's a, a region which is really very poor, uh, very uh, rich in traditions. There are a lot of people uh, that are uh, very, there are, there are people on the way that are very generous and at the same time, uh, we have people that are very poor uh, and the violence, criminal violence, and we have also countries that are in war. All these circumstances make the people to leave their home countries. We are speaking about the uh, uh, changing of their places of living and they, it is provoked by, uh, uh, by, by provoked, uh, and whatever they are looking for is to survive. They come to Mexico, entering through the borders of the southern part, and uh, it's also a country where uh, they are refused, uh, where the government and the authorities are very corrupted. Uh, uh, they have to face the uh, organized crime, and uh, the life, uh, the life of a migrant uh, is not worth much. They have to face the crim criminal uh, people, and they uh, have to uh, they have to face violation. And uh, Mexicans pay money. Pay money to be trafficked in effect? Sí. Yes, of course, they pay some money. Uh, the way of a migrant uh, from Central America to the United States may, uh, may cost about $12,000. Uh, and the value, uh, of, uh, the value and the cost of one, uh, for one trafficant, and before it was cheaper, now it's more than $10,000. And uh, it is mm, uh, it is very much more uh, expensive to pay uh, to try to liberate them. When I was in Honduras um, uh, doing work for El Nino and climate in 2016, I was told there were so many young people who went tried to go through Mexico to the United States, were turned back, and went again. Do you find people coming more than once to your organization? Yes, 
2014 and in 2015, and 2015 uh, they declare that there exists the um, uh, young people cri crisis uh, leaving the Central America and go from go to Guatemala and uh, pass through the Mexico to go to the United States. Uh, children that were uh, uh, the children were from the migrant families, and since childhood they were migrants. The adolescents that escape. Um, pandillas or, or maras that uh, a lot of uh, those young people and the adolescents they take the way the route of a migrant to to reach to the USA. I was very pleased to learn that you also uh, support and help those from the LGBTQ community, the gay and lesbian uh, community, uh, because they can be very vulnerable. Tell me. And their story and how you became particularly aware of their need for support. Sí. Yes, uh, within the frames of uh, the group, vulnerable group, we have the LGB, LG, uh, LGBT group. There are uh, some persons and gr uh, groups of people that are much more vulnerable. Uh, the women, the children, and the uh, LGBT uh, community, uh, lesbians, transsexuals, homosexuals, all these people, uh, why, why, uh, why they are much more vulnerable than uh, women? Because uh, a tra um, they can uh, violate a woman, um, of course, uh, an adolescent, he is uh, vulnerable because of seeing, being uh, vulnerable. Uh, but uh, imagine a situation of a transsexual uh, child that can be a victim of the authorities uh, and the victim of his uh, of the people surrounding him. That is why we are we are designing also a kind of project for every group of vulnerable people or every vulnerable group and we are demonstrating them the psychological assistance and we are realizing social work to, do, to give them support and contribute uh, to rehabilitation. And what are the main obstacles, the main problems that you face in your work? I think that we have three principal obstacles facing. The, the Mexican, Mexican uh, authorities in my country, uh, I can say that the authorities are very corrupted and the corruption goes to the highest level of the authorities. And because of this, there is second obstacle, organized crime that is due to the corrupted authorities. We have the crisis, uh, generalized violence, uh, and it is be, there is a kind of war that is very uh, bad, uh, badly designed. We have also the problem of drugs. Uh, they tra they are also working for uh, for dra drug trafficking. Uh, they uh, take the drugs with them. It is uh, while uh, while being engaged in human trafficking, they are they are also kidnapping them. They are uh, violating them. And in the Central America, they are take from the Central America they are taking those people and. Uh, they are abusing them. And our society, uh, we are, uh, with the, in, in our society, with the new era in the United States, Mexico is a country of migrants. And we have 11,000 migrants without documents. And we are uh, also um, um, conscious of the pain that they are suffering. Uh, but uh, the Mexican state uh, still uh, faces, uh, the Mexican state still has the problem of xenophobia and the discrimination of those people. Yeah, you, you have mentioned, um, you know, the 
corruption and um, the problems faced with some of the authorities, but also I think uh, there are good Mexicans, even in official positions, who recognize, for example, in our work, which I do with my foundation on climate displaced people, the Global Compact on Migration, Mexico is an ally. Mexico is a supporter of good migration policy. Uh, what, do you, what do you say about that? The migration policy in Mexico is very uh, similar to whatever there is in the continent. We are speaking about the cir circle in the Central America and in the American continent as a whole. There are some countries that are the destination countries that uh, we have also some countries that are the countries that are making people live, that live, uh, the, that live on, the, on, on the migration and countries that earn money from these. Mexico, Honduras, El Salvador, they live, they live from the economy. From the or on the money that is coming from the migrants, y por eso the migration policy in the whole continent, persecution, uh, detention, uh, deportation uh, to the places uh, from there they have come to, they are sending the people. Uh, they are uh, sending the people that is uh, looking uh, for a better life to die. So they are sending them to, the, to their countries of origin. They are sending them back. Um, I was watching your face on the video. And because I'm on the uh, committee jury, that's the second time I saw the video. And I was struck at how sad you seemed, how burdened you seemed. So what inspires you and are you hopeful about the future? Uh, sí. <laughs> you didn't smile much on the video. <laughs> Ahora lo estoy. Uh, now I have the smile. Es, es this is to live with the uh, with the deaf together with the deaf, and it's very very difficult and extremely difficult to uh, receive those victims. And they are not 10, and they are not 11, they are every day thousands of people crossing the southern borders. This means that you have to live with the pain all the time. And our house that is called, called uh, Las uh, La 72, uh, we, we, are the, we are the ancestors uh, of the people coming from Latin America. We also uh, leave these uh, sufferings. And we have uh, uh, learned also from the migrants. I am repeating once more that our inspiration is a continuous inspiration. There are a lot of families. Uh, there are a number of uh, children, the children that do not understand that they are that, that are passing those routes completely in order to come to reach to our house. Sometimes they entertain, uh, and where we we having seen those children that are they happy when they are at our house, we also feel that inspiration to go on. Muchas gracias, eh, felicidades, and thank you also to the interpreter who was interpreting in both directions. Very hard to do. Gracias a usted, Arturo. Thanks a lot, uh, y, uh, thanks everybody. Uh, thank you to Father Thomas and Mary Robinson. And now we're going to hear from our third Aurora humanitarian, Cho Hla Un. But before we do, and he'll be joined uh, by Lord Darcy, before they come on to stage, we're going to show you another video which you'll see some of his work. The 
Rohingya Muslims have lived in Yakai state since 11th century. But since 1982, the government do not want to accept Rohingya people as an ethnic group. They don't issue citizenship to us. They say that we are illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. They try to call us Bengali, but we are not from Bangladesh. We doesn't want to give this land to Bangladesh. We want to live under this Burmese government under law and order. Rohingya people is one of the most persecuted minorities in the world. The Rakhine extremists attack us, but the authorities do not take any action. Our people are rejected to apply for the job, for education and for health care. We cannot travel anywhere without permission. Now we cannot vote. So what is the law? Where is the law? Discrimination, as we are Muslim. So I started to fight for the rights of my people. I am the only Rohingya lawyer in this area who can complain to the authorities and who can inform other countries. So the authorities are not fully really satisfied with me. In total, I spent more than 10 years in prison. I am a lawyer, but now the law and order is not for us. Yeah, you can see there, very bad condition. Uh, for this uh, three years, uh, no job, no nothing uh, to eat. We formed a committee to purchase rice and distribute it to the very poor. I also started to provide education to our children and elderly people. We also appointed nearly 110 teachers and more than 10,000 children are also uh, getting uh, the education. The new crisis broke out in August 2017 in Northern Rakhine State. Thousands of Rohingya people lost their lives. Many drowned fleeing. It was the biggest exodus of Rohingya people from Myanmar. More than half of the population now live in refugee camps. The situation is still very tense. In Somnia, our relations are also there. But we cannot go and see a support to them, provide anything to them. Bit by bit, they are doing such things for genocide. I don't want to leave my land. I am encouraging my people to stay here. I have faith that one day we will achieve our rights. So, please welcome to the stage Cho La Un, lawyer and Rohingya leader, as you've seen on the video, and he's going to be talking to Lord Aradazi, director of the Institute of Global Health Innovation, Imperial College London. He is also an Aurora Prize Selection Committee member. Thank you. <laughs> Stone, that was the most touching video yeah, I've seen thank you. for a long, long time. Yeah. Many congratulations, first of all for being one of the finalists. We're very, very proud of that. Uh, you live in a region in the world that the whole global community is concerned about. We've seen many of these videos, and may I, as I've said to you before, declare an interest that I happen to sit on an advisory committee. So I have been in Rakhine certainly three times, yes. and in recent times, uh, it's been troubled me as well. So tell me a bit more about the story of Rakhine, the Muslims in Rakhine, not just the last 35. Give us a bit of history, context. We are living there since decades and decades. Our forefathers forefather are also from this Yakhine land. Yeah. At the time, first, we are called Rohingya. Then, New the power in 1962. Then he is, bit by bit, he is also kicking out all the uh, Rohingya Muslims from the job. 
And in 1978, there was a, a Nagami uh, operation. And during this period in 1978, nearly 300 or 400,000 Rohingya peoples fled to Bangladesh. So then, when the UN also asked the Myanmar government, Nguyen, General Nguyen, he again make a, made a, to repatriate sure. all the peoples from Bangladesh. So then, then he allowed to live in their own land. It now also, in 2012, we are also drove from our land in, in downtown sure. during city. Sure. I was also a government servant uh, from 1962, 1983, for 24 years. Then, I, then the new government and the, the governments are also making discrimination upon the Muslims, so I retired from my job in 1983. Okay, so, and the big one was in August of last year, where the same thing <laughs> happened as in 1978. Now, tell me something about you, because you've shown a lot of bravery, <laughs> you locally, which is not an easy thing to do. Yeah. Just tell me some of the contributions you've made to your community, which has been suffering for such a long time. Yes, in 1986, uh, there was a huge uh, confiscation of the land, confiscating of the land by the government yeah. uh, from Rohingya people. Do you mean their houses and their schools, yes, their community? Yes, to destroy all the, these, so they order to destroy all the schools, malls, and their houses, and to evacuate this land. Okay. But uh, they came to me, uh, before they came to me, uh, they went to so many lawyers, yes. no one wants to, to, to prosecute protect, you uh, yeah, because uh, you have such a high standing. Yes, so that they came to me, but not high in standard. Okay. <laughs> so they came to me and I am also uh, suffering from them, from them because it is a big valley. Yes. Nearly 500 uh, houses were there okay. and also so many plugging land there, paddy okay. land. So they are very sad of this. So they asked me to apply okay. to General Nguyen. At that time, General Nguyen was the president of yes. the Myanmar yes. uh, Socialist Party. Sure, sure. So then I that. wrote an application okay. to General Nguyen. I went, it is very long history, sure, sure, but sure. I am summarized this one. Sure. So I went, I submit some uh, application to uh, state government, yeah. and also I took some to Yangon okay. to submit all these applications. After my return to Yangon, uh, from Yangon, so the state government arrested me and with me another 10 uh, farmers elders were also arrested. We are all together 11. So we faced this case for two years, pending, uh, also trialing in the court. In 1988, the whole country was demonstrated, under, demonstrated yes. by the public. Yes. So, at the time, the prison was broken. Right. I was in the cell room, so I cannot go out. So, our... You wouldn't escape, no? It's no, I cannot in. escape, no. but the Bar Association made a committee and came to the prison, and they, they, released, re you. they released me, okay. and at the time, I was very sick. So then, in, after a few days, General Somo cooped the power of the government. Yeah. First, there is no government. Yeah. So this uh, bar association is controlling the town. So, and after General Somo cooped the power, he ordered to form political parties. Okay. So we formed a political parties, party named National Democratic Party for Human Rights. Sure. So I, yeah. after forming this political party, I went to Sitwe and Rakhine State. I organized town by town uh, yeah. to our Rohingya people to vote 
our sure, sure, sure. yes to so vote our party. You wanted to get into the Rakhine Parliament. I've been to the Rakhine Parliament, and the first no, question, no, no. At that no. time, not the Rakhine Parliament is not separated. Okay, but the, the it, national it, national parliament. Okay. So then I stand for parliament member. All right. Uh, from uh, number seat yes. number one position. Then the Western commander was General Miatin. Sure. So he investigate okay. that who can win, who can be win okay. this okay. election. Yeah. Then he order again to arrest me. Okay. So, so you, you didn't get into parliament. Yes, okay. I cannot. Okay. All right. So okay. Okay. my my case was sent to the court martial. Yeah. Court martial order me for 14 years. Court martial ordered you in prison for, for 14 years? For, uh, within one hour, they order me for 14 years in prison. As, as a civilian? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, well, you've been unbelievably brave, and uh, your community has suffered a lot of persecution yeah. based on race and religion. Yeah. We've seen what we've seen since August of last year. Say you happen to be one of the three winners here. What could you do? What, 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 what do you think the world should be doing? What do you think the government should be doing in terms of changing this around? Reconciliation? What's your thoughts on that? Do you think there is a hope in this for you and your So community? many ambassadors and also journalists also visit me Yes. Uh, after this 2012. Yes. Also, I was arrested in 2012 again. Yes. When the, this conflict was going on, this uh, uh, radical uh, Yakai also set fire village by village, sure. and last, at last they came to our village yeah. to set fire. But our village is only uh, 46 houses there, uh, Rohingya Muslims' houses, and also surrounding our old Yakai. The so big they big doesn't big. want to set fire because it can be uh, also... Pictures. Uh, uh, it will be big for the Yakai. Yep. So this destroy our houses and our mosques. My library was totally Go. destroyed, and also my books were thrown out of the, uh, the houses, and yep. the house was also totally destroyed. So, and on that day, the police arrest me again, arrest me and send me to the prison. So, at that time, I was the administrator of Medic Medicine Sense Frontier Holland. I work for Medicine San Frontier Holland since yeah. uh, 1998 to yeah. 2012, 14 years. Then they threw, so after my arrest, uh, our country manager, Mr. Peter Paul, he was a dash in Yangon. So they went to Nipido uh, to apply for me, to release me. So they uh, put up some application for me and after investigation, yeah. uh, uh, President thinks in order to withdraw my case and to release me. Okay. So I was released on the 16th August uh, 2012. 2012. 12. Okay. So yeah. that was around the same time in which there was, you know, I've seen them. There are a number of IDPs in your yes, area. Yes, uh, at that time, all the uh, Muslims from downtown yeah. are drove to Takebi. Yeah. You, you visit there. Yeah. Uh, the KB and other camps there. Yeah. But I was at that time in prison, so you, I didn't you know. Wh the, okay. oh, oh, I didn't know where my family were. Right. And then but, after my release, so the police sent me to my uh, family. Then I, I, I come to know family. that my family were there. Okay. So in 2017, yeah. when the most recent, many of your community left and walked and survived some 800,000 people, as the figure is said. They're yes. all in Bangladesh now. What do you think you could do in helping them come back? Yes, also some ambassadors and also they came to me, but we cannot visit Mongdo. Yeah. We cannot uh, go from this uh, city to other township. Yeah. But I am taking some uh, message from online from Mongdo and Butidong. So uh, they are trying to, to relocate again there. But the government and the UN is also not agree yet. Okay. Yesterday I saw on Facebook that there is a, an agreement also done by UN and UNDP 
uh, yes. to... Do, does that encourage you that an agreement has happened between mm -hmm. the government and the UNHCR and UNDP? Yeah. Is that an encouragement, do you think? Yes, but uh, I, I didn't think that uh, the government will accept these people. They try to uh, kick out all the Muslims from the land. Always they are breaking their, their promise. Okay. So Kofi Annan, who you met? Yes, I met four Nations. times. Yes. He made 88 recommendations. Yes. Do you think some of these are happening? Not yet. Not yet. Only they relocate some people in Choctaw. Yes. But nearby the village, they send these nearly 40, 50 houses there. In Mebong, I, I think you visit Mibung. Yes. Mibung. Yes. There were some uh, Muslims there, Rohingya Muslims there, uh, but they are relocated in uh, what is called flooded area. So they report me. Re they report me in return. So I, I approach to some uh, ambassadors and also to UN uh, for that. So. Also, they are trying to relocate in situ, but it is only they are talking, but not practically we didn't see anything. So, you've shown a lot of bravery, as I said earlier. I've just met your son as well earlier, <laughs> who, just tell us the story, you are a citizen, yeah. you hold a citizenship, yeah. correct? Yeah. Of Myanmar, but your son doesn't. Yeah, yeah it is tell also they are doing... Even uh, the government is didn't issuing uh, birth certificate since 30 years, yeah. 30, 35 years. So we are also uh, arguing, approaching for that to ambassadors. A few days ago, also Mr. Scott Marshall, ambassador of the America, and also uh, Mr. Green, sure. the USA, they visit me. Yeah. I also uh, submit our demand to them not to mention their race yeah. in okay. scrutiny cards. Sure. If without the race, it, it is no problem. So I can organize our people to accept this guy. But okay. the, the, the lower authorities trying to give the race Bengali, sure. but we are not Bengali. You know, you're, you're Rakhine. Yeah. Rakhine yeah. and also Rohingya. Sure. In, before this, Bangladesh was independent. Yeah. Yep. They didn't call us Bangli. Okay. At that time, we are called sure. Yakai Muslims sure. or Rohingya. Sure. Sure. Okay. Then, after this Bangladesh independence, they tried to call us Bangli. Okay. But we does not want to give our land to Bangladesh. Sure. Good. On that point, just say it's a privilege to meet you. We're very, very proud to have you as one of our three finalists. And, you know, salute you for your bravery, your, not just yours, but your community and wish you the best uh, back there. And I'll very much, we all hope, this will turn around and the global community is behind you. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you to Chopra and uh, Lord Darcy. Well, we've heard from three inspiring people. One, rehabilita one is rehabilitating victims of sex trafficking in India. One is helping immigrants on their harrowing journey through Mexico, and one is fighting for human rights for the Rohingya in Myanmar. I think there's going to be lots to talk about over lunch, and lunch will be served on the fourth floor if you want to make your way up there now. Please, could you be back here at 2.45 so we're able to start in good time our third session. Thank you. <laughs>